Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to our presentation today. Um, our topic of our webinar today is, is your environmental monitoring program hitting the mark? My name is Sarah Curran. I'm Marketing Communication Specialist with Eurofin Scientific, Inc. And I'll be here just to facilitate our presentation, ask you guys some questions, and make sure everything runs smoothly. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded. Copies of the slides and the recording will be available to everyone who's registered, and it will be sent to you via email. It will also be online in the EurofinsUS.com Food Resource Center. There will be time for question and answer after the presentation with our wonderful presenters. So the way that you ask your questions is by using either the question box in your GoToWebinar dashboard, or you can tweet your questions throughout the presentation at Eurofins using hashtag EMPCheckup. We'll be monitoring Twitter through the entire presentation, so if you have questions, comments, if you're encountering any issues, go ahead and tweet those at Eurofins, or mention that in the comments section in your GoToWebinar dashboard, and we'll try to get that resolved for you. So before we get started, a little bit about Eurofins. Eurofins is driven by our mission to contribute to global health by offering the highest quality testing, training, auditing, and consulting services. We strive to listen to our customers and not simply meet, but exceed your expectations. Eurofins is a full service provider for food safety services, including, but not limited to, microbiology and chemistry testing. We are your one-stop shop for both routine and specialized testing, auditing, training, consulting, and candid expert advice like this webinar. Our footprint is global with over 400 laboratories in 42 countries, and we have a portfolio of 150 analytical methods. So right now I'd like to introduce our wonderful presenters, Doug Marshall and John Kukoli. Doug Marshall is the Chief Scientific Officer with Eurofins Microbiology, and John Kukoli is the Director of BRC Americas. Before we get started, I'd like to warm up everybody with a polling question. So our first question of the day will be, are you currently certified? I'll give everyone a few seconds to respond. All right, we're at 70%, just a few more seconds. Let everyone get their responses in. Okay, and I'll close that, and we can see everyone's results. So 68% of attendees said yes, I am certified. My Location is certified and 32% said no. So next up, we'll ask, are you satisfied with your current certification body? We'll give everyone just a few seconds to respond to that. Okay, in just a few more seconds to let everyone get their final responses in. Okay, and with that, I'll close the poll and demonstrate and share what our responses were. So it looks like 88% of you said yes. That's great news. And with that, I'm going to hand our presentation over to John Kukoli of BRC Americas to talk to you guys a little bit about EMP and BRC.
You got it, John? I got it. Can you see my screen, everyone? Excellent. Yeah. I'm going to assume so unless I hear from Sarah. Thank you very much, Sarah. Great introduction. Great start to things. And uh, good morning to everyone. Good afternoon, depending where you are. Um, John Cocoli, um, what I'm going to do is really have a quick touch on how BRC looks at environmental monitoring, how we how we assess it during the certification process, what that means to the sites that are certified to BRC and to sites that use BRC as part of their supply chain approval mechanism. So we're going to touch off on those two things and should be able to just give you a, a good impression of where BRC uh, is taking uh, the environmental monitoring program, especially with version 8 coming up. BRC has been around for a long time. We've been here for over 20 years. Uh, we are the leading uh, GFSI recognized benchmarked um, program. We're, we're the largest, we're the most rigorous. Uh, we're the, you know, basically the standard of choice. And it's, it's something that we've always maintained that position through strength of the program and by really being industry leading in where the expectations are. So if you go back within GFSI, even just a couple of years, there was really no expectation around or mi minimal expectation around uh, environmental monitoring. So what we did is we had some in version 7, it was a lighter touch. Now with version 8, it's really going to come home to roost. And I'm going to touch on how we're going to, uh, what we've got in the works for version 8 as far as that. Because we, pr we, we really pride ourselves on being industry leading. Being the first to introduce aspects, really showing the way in food safety, really understanding where things uh, need to go and helping the industry become, um, simply become better. So... When you're talking about environmental monitoring program, and Doug's going to get into a lot of specific details about it, what you, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of it, but from a certification, from an audit perspective, this is what we look at to a great extent. What's the intent of the program? How are you managing it? How have you designed it? And if you think about it, the intent of an environmental program is to find weakness. The intent of an environmental program is not to show that we have no pathogens. It's rare to find a facility that has zero risk of pathogens, certainly in a ready-to-eat facility. So we really want to see is the intent of the program to hunt and destroy. That's the classic uh, mechanism or mindset you have with an environmental program. We want to find the, we want to find it. If it's there, we're going to find it. We're going to keep changing and evolving our program to make sure we get it. Next step, you know, once you've, you've created that mindset and you've understood what the what the desired outcome of your environmental monitoring program is, you have to develop a sampling plan. It's not random, it's not routine, and you think of who knows where the dirty secrets are in the facility. It's people like sanitation, maintenance, operations, pre-op inspection people. They're the people that really know where the gunk is, where the problems are, where those hidden uh, potential uh, harborage points are. So you want to make sure that when you're developing your sampling plan, you're bringing all the available expertise within your facility to bear on where do we, where is the best place to look as an indicator of where our risk is. Not just food surface, not just random places, and certainly not places where we know it'll be clean. Those are, are, are almost of limited value, certainly in an ongoing environmental program. What are our target organisms? That's unique. You need to understand that, you know, these are these are the risks that are significant to our product. Uh, we may have a number of different target pathogens we look at. We may have only specific ones. We're not gonna get it down into great detail. It's somewhere between you know, E. coli and SPEC, or, or specifically naming the E. coli, there, there's a group that we wanna be worried of. Indicator organ, organisms and testing for those, very, very valuable, especially when you're building your program. Again, go back to sampling plan development. What you wanna find are the hot spots. You don't, you don't build your sampling plan based on data from pathogen tests. You may build it based on data from an ATP swab. So we're going to know where the where the harborage points are. Where's the food? Where's the potential? Where's the risk? We may narrow that down with uh, ATP type or, or generic swabbing plating, and then we're going to target down on those organisms. So we may use different mechanisms to identify target organisms in their sampling plan. Test methodology, we want to make sure it's robust. We want to make sure it's recognized. We don't want to grow pathogens in our facility, so we're probably going to look to some expertise like Eurofins to be able to bring it outside to maintain that safety. What are we going to do when we find it? It's great to have a sampling plan. You have to assume at some point you're going to find something that's going to raise alarm bells. Better to have a corrective action program outlined rather than scramble at that point. That's all great. Two big things we have to make sure we, we do. Ongoing data use. It's not about the results. It's about the data the 
course of the data, the direction that it's going, you know, getting, getting no pathogens on one set of swabs for your environmental program is great. Getting no pathogens for nine months in a row, we have to say that, wait a minute, maybe we're doing the wrong thing. Maybe we're not looking hard enough for the right places. So it's really about that review of the ongoing data, of trends, of what picture does it paint over time. That's more important than individual results. And then, of course, review. Remember, validation is what we do to prove it works. Verification to make sure it is working or it's being performed. Review is when we ask the question, are we doing the right thing? And again, this comes back to, geez, it's been 18 months. We haven't had any significant fines. We haven't had any issues. Maybe we need to take a look. Or our, our, our shelf life data is telling us we've got some weakness in environmental management, but our environmental program's not. You know, what are the triggers that come back into play to say we need to take another look at it? So what's the mindset? Design to find it. Absolutely. Make sure that you're targeting, uh, you know, you, the goal is we want to find pathogens. We want to find harborage points. We want to find potential areas for pathogens. This is not an end in itself. It's a way to improve everything, to improve our maintenance, our production, our in process, the length of our production runs, our sanitation, our QA. This is giving us data to be able to manage everything else we do. Are our employees washing their hands properly? Are they maintaining the uniforms? Is our footwear policy appropriate? All of that is improved when we have a good solid set of data from our environmental monitoring program. Remember that seek and destroy mindset. Absolutely we have to do. And don't forget about validation. Is this working? Are we? When you think about the design, uh, there are some other things to, to keep in mind. Make sure that you're, you know, when you're when you're figuring out your your sampling locations, it's basic experience. Get some get some uh, outside information. Where are those hard to find spots? Where has someone gotten burned before? Make sure you're bringing in all those additional people. Maintenance, sanitary, maintenance are great folks. They take stuff. Don't forget, they take stuff apart all the time. They've seen what's inside, what's behind the covers, what's underneath. They're the ones with the flashlights and the tools, so they're going to tell you where where the problems are and where to look. Make sure, as I said, you're design you're, you're looking for hot spots nice compliment is using ATP if you're finding high hits on your ATP sampling or monitoring system you now are pointing in a certain direction does that correspond with where your sampling locations are yes we're good no we need to review our program and understand our, if our sampling programs are correct biggest case biggest issue when you start designing your program Use data from your worst case situation. What's the longest run? What's the worst time of the year? When's our, when is our sanitation the weakest? What's the hardest thing to clean up after? Where's the longest point of rest between sanitation finishing without, without sanitizing and then production starting? So what you can do is really do a good, do your routine cleanup have an extended shutdown. If you've already got one planned over a holiday or over a long weekend, don't sanitize. Let stuff grow. Now do your sampling, your ATP, your 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 plate, your, your general plate counts. Do a generic look to say, okay, what did sanitation leave behind that could be an issue if our sanit sanitizing step is weak? You of course may need to clean, you may need to, you probably want to clean and sanitize prior to starting up. But Always consider worst case. If you design your system to work and to manage within worst case conditions, life is good because you're rarely going to hit those and you know it's going to be safe. That'll, you'll be able to sleep well at night. Remember as well, those spelled right, uh, challenge frequency and triggers. So I've got a program, well designed, well managed, it's validated, we verify that we're doing it. How long do you run that program looking at your trends and your results before you go back and say, is this right? Is it good? Is it going to be every quarter, every six months, once a year? We're going to look at all the data and understand, are we doing the right thing? Is this program delivering what we really need it to deliver? And then what would be triggers? Shelf life changes, uh, complaints about off spoilage, uh, any, any spoilage indication. What, what in your particular production environment or with your product would be an indicator of slippage within your environmental management? or management program because if you've got a monitoring program and things are happening that your monitoring program is not picking up we have to go back to the drawing board and fix that so again this is this is basics but we want to make sure we have uh, the understanding when we talk about testing 
Yes, we're going to zone our, 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 our app operation. Finished product testing, we're going to be real careful about that. We're going to understand the ramifications of finding a positive finished product. Sometimes it's useful. We're going to zone things, food contact zones, post-process, non-contact environment. Remember, where is it at risk? Our product is most at risk post-process prior to being sealed in a package. That's where we really have to focus, but not 100%. We're also going to bring in those zone three areas, those non-exposed areas. Uh, where you know it might be a warehouse, might be a change room, might be things like that. Where if it's present, our vectors will probably bring it in, but we can't find necessarily find it in our zone one area or zone two area. So we're in, a, in our exposed area. So make sure that we've got a program that covers the entire operation, the entire facility. What we're tasting, uh, species probably good, serotype probably not. Don't get too particular. If you spend all your time looking for 017H7 and you've got listeria growing, you miss the mark. So I have a lot of faith in things like ATP and uh, generic plate testing as indicators of loss of control. Uh, you know, if you start seeing numbers in those areas that are out of our out of our typical, uh, then we know maybe we got to look in those areas for we have may some may have some issues within the pathogen realm. So keep an eye on that. And again, where do we look? Where do we test? That, that nice, shiny, flat, um, vertical food contact surface? Probably not. That's easy to clean. What we want to look for, food, moisture, other environmental conditions that are really going to support the growth of pathogens because that's the key. Leaving one salmonella behind is generally not an issue. Leaving a salmonella behind that can grow and, and, and multiply and cause a pool so that when we start up Monday morning or after a long weekend, we now run that pool through. That's where we have issues. Don't forget, a good environmental program is one that finds stuff. It's not pointing out problems, it's giving you opportunity to fix things before they become a problem. There, there, I guarantee in every facility, there are little more environmental lapses, little events that pop up and your routine characteristics of your product, your routine operation just minimizes the impact of that. What you wanna do is turn those into, aha, here's another opportunity to eliminate a potential risk. So make sure as part of your program design, you have a full complement of reactions corrective actions, corrections, preventative actions when something indicates there's an issue. Depending on the on the on the depth of the issue, you're going to correct it absolutely. We're going to put corrective action in place to make sure it doesn't happen again to the best of our knowledge, but we're going to use that ongoing data to do root cause analysis. Wonderful, wonderful tool within a food industry to be able to really chase down cause causal effects of certain things. So I talked about review triggers. Every program you design you know, you're going to validate that it works, you're gonna have verification steps, you're gonna have documents. So basically every control program, the last steps you should put in place are, when do we review this? How often do we come and just ask the question, is it working? Annual is always nice, it's easy, it's easy to remember, it can be scheduled, but you should also have specific triggers. So we should say, well, I'm going to review my environmental monitoring program every 18 months, every year, every six months, whatever works for you and your organization and the risks. I'll do that regardless. But should any of these other triggers indicate there's a, there's a problem, I'm gonna jump back in and do an earlier review. So if I'm getting positives, that's good, but maybe maybe we have to make sure that we're, we're doing things right. If I get no results, you know, if, if, if honestly, if, you show, if you're looking at a supplier or, or a site that you're auditing and they've got five years worth of data with zero fines on their on their environmental monitoring program, I can guarantee you they do not have a good program. Um, you know, that should be a trigger. Now, you, how long can you go without a fine? Depends on your operation and what the risks are. Product failures, complaints, new science, new risks, we have to keep on top of those. And of course, any significant change to the operation of the facility, new products, new equipment, new process, uh, especially things like construction within the facility walls, those are all, hey, we need to take a look at our environmental monitoring program. So what are we doing with food aid? Yes, it is coming out. I wanna be clear about the dates though. Right now, as of today, it's posted on our website as a review for draft. So please take a look at our website. This is for you and this is also for your supply chain. Um, these are the ideas we've been asked to consider for it. We need to know what it, what impact positive and negative it has on the industry. We'd love your input. That's open until the end of the year. 
other dates, it will be fully published August 2018. Audits will start against it February 2019. Very strict on those on those dates. Um, so what is it? What is Food Aid looking at for environmental monitoring? The exact terminology is in there, but essentially a well-designed program. The auditor will focus on design considerations. Why did you choose these organisms? Why did you choose these test areas? Why did you choose this frequency? How did you come to these decisions? That's where the auditor is going to focus their time. We expect people to have an environmental monitoring program. That's easy. Anybody can take that one off the list. Is it a good one? So how is it designed? What are the limits? What are the indicators? What are the triggers? And again, what are your review and how do you continually improve and challenge yourself? So it's not simply a checklist of do you have an environmental program? Yes, you have sample locations. Yes, anybody can do that. This is really about having a great program, which is again what BRC really prides themselves on. So not not significant change for those of you who have an environmental monitoring program, but those of you who have an environmental monitoring program that's been ongoing for several years and don't have that information about how the heck was this designed, that's something you may need to revisit, perhaps a re review of things. So fundamentals. I mean. It is simple. Doug's going to go into details from our perspective, fundamentals. Get the right team, get the right information. Understand what you're looking for. Understand your operation. Bring the right people to the table. Design to find. Design to find, design to find. Keep it deliberate. We want this to get rid of, to root out potential risks. Focus area, post-process, exposed product, but we have to remember our plant is full of vectors. I don't care if they're shoes, uniforms, maintenance, tools, equipment, pallets. There are tons of vectors, and we want to understand what they can possibly be bringing into that high-risk area. Keep in mind, just last-minute warnings of this thing. No fines means maybe, maybe I, I would love to find a facility, and every now and then you do find a facility where they it's just environmentally bang on, you, they have control, they have complete control. Chances are, if you're not finding anything, there's something odd. Um, remember that when I said you have to have a reaction, a corrective action when you, or a deviation procedure, make sure it includes what do we do about the product that's potentially at risk? How do we assess that? The last thing you wanna do is find on a product contact surface um, pathogen and then not react to protect potential product that's at risk. Prove each step. Make sure you're doing it right. Make sure you're comfortable with it. And remember, if it's good now, if you have a fantastic sanitation program, nature will find a way to get around you. That's its job. Nature's way, microbial way, is to find a niche, find a way through, find a, something you haven't covered. That's their job. They do it well. We know that. So that flexibility and that ongoing continual improvement mindset is hugely important. So as I said, or as I'm sorry, as Sarah said, questions we're going to leave to the end. Uh, please remember, type them in now, send them in now so Sarah can get them teed up for us and we can get things going. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Doug. I'm going to interject here really quickly to ask everyone one more polling question. Thank you, Sarah. I'll let everything load up here really quick. So. We have one more polling question before I hand it off to Doug. Um, and thank you everyone who sent in feedback about those last two polling questions. They were kind of vague. We were asking about GFSI certification in general. So this time we'll try to make it more clear. Are you considering GF using GFSI certification to improve your brand protection beyond your current standards? Let's give everyone a few minutes to respond. And I'll let Doug get all queued up here. Just a few more seconds. Okay. Looks like responses have stopped coming in. So with that, I will close the poll and share our results.
So it looks like 45% said yes, almost 30% said no, and over a quarter of attendees are currently in the process of improving their brand protection using a GFSI scheme. So with that, I will hand it over to Doug Marshall. Okay, thank you, Sarah. No problem. So hopefully everyone can see my slides and see my uh, funny looking face. So I, I want to thank John. Your slides, Doug. You can't see my slides. Okay. Doing show screen. Well, clicking that on. Is that better? Give it just a sec. I don't think we're able to see your slides, Doug. Oh, there we go. Perfect. All right. Sorry. Sorry Proceed. for the slow connection. So I want to thank uh, John for giving us uh, BRC's perspective. Uh, clearly, environmental monitoring is a component of a larger food safety plan and how it fits into holding up the entire food safety programs that a manufacturer may have is uh, obviously some of the fundamentals are good manufacturing practices, uh, sanitary uh, operating procedures, uh, any kind of hazard analysis, as well as um, um, critical process controls that you have in your program, all are designed to make sure that the manufactured products are safe. And then environmental monitoring is a way to um, verify that these um, prior programs are actually working. So I just want to make sure you have a feeling for how that fits into the broader scheme of things. When you look at other preventative controls, uh, there are training programs, there are written records. Um, you need to validate, as John said, whether or not your control measures are working. And then you would do periodic verification. Uh, oftentimes that involves testing, but not always. Uh, certainly auditing programs are a great way to verify that a uh, manufacturer's food safety program is working. Uh, and then food label review is a good one for um, potentially controlling unwanted allergens in your uh, product or your process. Environmental monitoring then has the following components. It's a baseline sanitation program where you're really looking for, um, as John mentioned, finding these potential niches that can harbor uh, microbes and then making sure that your sanitation program uh, eliminates those microbes uh, before you start processing. Uh, there is a testing component because this is a way you can validate your program, but it's also a way to verify on a routine, regular basis whether or not these uh, sanitation program is working. Then you take data from this monitoring and you uh, evaluate whether the data you're getting is meeting your specifications for both indicators as well as potentially for allergens or for spoilage microorganisms or for pathogens. Once you've done this uh, evaluation, then if you have anything that does not meet your specifications, you need to do a root cause analysis um, and do some corrective actions based on the results of that analysis. So what kinds of microbes are uh, going to be your target in your environmental monitoring program? So I can simply say that all pathogens could potentially be a problem. And this picture is an open air drying system for red peppers. And you can just use your imagination and think about all the potential um, ways in which an environmental contaminant could potentially get on what could be a ready to eat product. Some recent examples were salmonella and peanut butter, salmonella hydrolyzed vegetable protein, listeria and ready to eat meat. And more recently, both pathogens have been, been environmental contaminants in a fresh ready to eat fruit product like cantaloupe. So a lot of different products that all have one characteristic and that was failure to control pathogens in the manufacturing environment. Back in the old days, when you looked at whether or not sanitation was working, you used your eyes and you did a visual verification. 
problem is with microbes, you can't see those with your eye. You need a powerful microscope and no one's walking around a facility with a microscope trying to find these microorganisms. So we need to use other techniques to be able to find these, these pathogens in the processing environment. So why would you then want to test for pathogens? Well, you get brand protection and liability uh, reduction. In many circumstances and in many regulatory jurisdictions, including in the U.S., there's a regulatory expectation for some kinds of products and manufacturing environments. You use environmental monitoring and testing to validate the effectiveness of your process controls, your uh, supply chain controls, as well as your um, um, sanitation controls. You can validate the effectiveness of your other environmental control programs and validate purchase specifications by you and or your customers. And then obviously environmental monitoring and testing for pathogens becomes very important when you're trying to prove compliance and when you're doing outbreak investigations. So testing comes at an expense. Obviously I'm biased. I work for a testing laboratory, so we would love to get your samples. But if you decide that uh, you don't want to test, what are the consequences? Well, there's potential for injuring your customer. Um, that certainly is not a long-term successful marketing program. There are the intrinsic and extrinsic costs associated with recalls. You have the potential facility cl closure and uh, loss of uh, business. You could also lose your personal job. Uh, there's damage brand reputation. And then with FISMA, if you are a preventative controls qualified individual, you now are personally liable. And uh, if you're not doing testing, how do you protect yourself if you're called before a judge and a jury trying to defend your company's management practices for food safety? Uh, I wanna give an example of where a company had a problem. Thankfully, no one uh, that, that I'm aware of was uh, uh, died or was sick. But it was a gigantic recall because of the presence of salmonella in a product called hydrolyzed vegetable protein. This is a flavor enhancing ingredient found in all different kinds of food products. Over, over a thousand product lots recalled, thousands of other different products were recalled. No illnesses were reported, but again, the uh, company strategy during this crisis, and I'll just let you read the one uh, in the red quote, we just wanted it to go away. So they did not have an effective program and they wound up having a huge problem uh, for themselves, but also for the people they were selling the product to. So why would you want to do uh, environmental monitoring? There's a regulatory perspective, again, in many circumstances. Many, many manufacturers are doing environmental monitoring because their customers have an expectation that they do that. And then, uh, as John said, it really should be your expectation to design a fantastic environmental product program that meets your needs. I want to also uh, philosophically uh, let you think about the last two quotes on this slide. Environmental monitoring is an essential component for microbial control, but it is not a control measure. So it's an assessment tool of the effectiveness of your other food safety controls. So you can't uh, fix things doing environmental monitoring. You can find where the problems are but then you need to go back to your other controls to make sure you fix those. What does FISMA say about environmental monitoring? So in the law, there's a section that says uh, preventative control should include uh, environmental and product testing programs. And then there's another section there that says an environmental monitoring program to verify the effectiveness of pathogen controls in processes where the food is exposed to a potential environmental contaminant in the environment. So basically, FDA and Congress is expecting food manufacturers in the U.S. to be doing environmental monitoring. So what is the role of testing in uh, your verification activities? So you can do end product testing. Obviously, that would be the um, <clears throat> data point that says, hey, everything in my process is working. But if you have random contamination uh, doing a one sample grab and testing that, you might miss problems. So moving further up the process and be able to do additional monitoring activities allows you to catch these uh, <clears throat> small items that might uh, wind up blowing in your face. So there's supplier verification activity, in-process material activities, and then in-product testing. For environmental monitoring, um, 
for manufacturers, I have allergens here, but for manufacturers that are manufacturing allergen-containing product and non-allergen-containing product using the same equipment in the same facility, you may want to verify whether that cleanup process going from allergen-containing to non-allergen-containing is actually uh, working. You can do indicator testing and set uh, baseline specifications based on those indicator counts. And you could also target specific pathogens. Where environmental monitoring, at least the philosophy of most uh, preachers of this, is anytime you have a ready-to-eat food that is exposed to the manufacturing environment, from a kill step until final package closure, then that is an opportunity for pathogens in the environment to contaminate that product prior to final package closure. So in that case, I think FDA is really forcing folks to do environmental monitoring to make sure that that process environment in that really targeted area is free from pathogens. So uh, the preventative controls rule has some um, language uh, regarding environmental monitoring. It should be scientifically valid. It should identify the test microorganisms, specify the locations where you're going to do the testing with the number of sites you're going to be testing, identify the timing and the frequency of collecting those samples, know um, what tests you're going to be uh, uh, executing on those specimens, what laboratory is going to be doing the testing, and then if you have an out-of-spec result, what is your corrective action going to be? So a great environmental monitoring program, again, as John mentioned, it's a search and destroy uh, mission. So it's find unwanted pathogens or allergens in the environment before they contaminate product, and then make sure you eliminate those uh, harbored sites before processing. Then you could also use environmental monitoring to assess the effectiveness of your other preventative control programs, such as employee hygiene practices. Where would you want to test? Again, John mentioned using a zone approach. We certainly do that. Uh, just the simplified version of that, you, you really have two major zones in a food manufacturing site. You have uh, equipment surfaces that have direct product contact, and then you have non-product contact surfaces. So the highest risk, obviously, is going to be surfaces where you actually have product touching uh, a piece of equipment. Uh, in terms of what are you looking for in terms of pathogens, we can simplify our thought process here a little bit, and we can uh, have you focus on salmonella as the target pathogen in an environmental monitoring program where the product in the process is usually a mo low moisture operation. Salmonella can exist in a quiescent state when it's dry for a long period of time and can get shed into the environment and find its way under product. Listeria monocytogenes is the pathogen of most concern um, in processes that have a high moisture manufacturing site and or a high moisture product that can support growth of Listeria monocytogenes. Does this mean we could ignore all the other pathogens? Of course not. They could also be a problem. But if you focus on controlling these two pathogens in these kinds of manufacturing environments, odds are very good you will control the other kinds of pathogens that might also be in that facility. And then again, be aware that uh, if allergens are a control problem for you, you want to make sure that those allergens are removed from those direct product contact surfaces if necessary for uh, product safety. Where do you do your control? As John mentioned, you're looking at a primary control. So this is, again, the um, area that is between a lethality step and final package closure. Many people manufacture products that have no kill step in the process. So under that circumstance, the entire facility is probably your primary control area. But that is a, a, a big consideration for you. Your EMP plan should be written where you identify the sampling sites. Uh, we recommend using a facility grid, and then uh, you would do random rotation amongst that during your routine monitoring. But if you know you have sp hot spots, again, as John re recommended, then you should always be looking at those hot spots every time you do your, uh, your sampling. So there's no reason just to randomly assign known hot spots and ignore them if you know they're a problem. 
Uh, your plan should also uh, articulate the frequency of the sampling, how many specimens are you going to be collecting, how you collect the specimens. We frequently find people collect samples and they cross-contaminate the sample during uh, sample collection. What test method is going to be used and is that method fit for the purpose of environmental monitoring? And then set your specifications and then what corrective actions you're going to do if you have an out-of-spec data point. Our recommendations on corrective actions are to make sure that you limit access to the area. So put some sort of physical barrier around a known hotspot so that you're not tracking that contaminant all throughout the facility. So you could use uh, crime tape, you could use uh, physical barriers, you could use uh, traffic cones, et cetera. So make sure you do not transport the hotspot areas all throughout the facility. Break down and inspect any suspect equipment in those areas thoroughly clean and sanitize all the equipment and the tools that are used in that area. Do increased investigative monitoring to make sure you have brought that hotspot back under control and uh, continue to monitor around that hotspot so that you find the source. So we do uh, recommend vector monitoring. So if you have a hotspot here, make sure you vector monitor all around that hotspot. So if you just remediate that spot and the source of contamination is here, you haven't brought that area back under control. Again, if your pre-op inspection fails, then don't start production. Reclean, resanitize, and resample as needed. Sarah, I think I have blasted through my section, so I will turn it back over to you. Yes, you did. Thank you, Doug, so much. We got quite a few questions come in which is wonderful. We still have time for everyone to submit questions. So go ahead and enter your questions in if you have time. But before we go um, into the question and answer portion, I'd like to ask you guys a few more questions about EMPs and what you guys do at your facilities. Just one second and we'll get those up. My first question is, do you currently have an environmental monitoring program? I'd hope that if you're attending this webinar for a checkup, you do have an active EMP program, but if some of you are here to learn, we want to know that. I'll give everyone just a few seconds because this should be an easy one. All right, we're at 70%. I'll give everyone just a few more seconds. This is also a great time to be submitting your questions in the question panel um, or tweeting your questions at Eurofins on Twitter. And with that, I'll close the poll and share our responses. So 87% of our attendees today said yes, and 13% do not currently have an environmental monitoring program. Our last question before we go into Q&A is, how do you currently perform environmental testing? Do you do it in-house or do you outsource your environmental tests? Okay, I'll give everyone just a few more seconds. Only 70% of people have voted. Okay, and with that, I will close our poll and share results. So it's a pretty even split, it looks like. 43% do in-house testing and 46% outsource. 11% it doesn't apply to. So with that, I will start pitching questions to Doug and John that you guys have submitted. 
Doug and John, if you guys want to turn on your webcam, take yourself off mute, and I have a few great questions ready for you from our audience. So, first up, we have a question from Janet. What is your opinion on genetic typing of positive findings with the goal of determining whether or not you have a resident or transient organism? I'll take a quick shot, but I think this is really gonna be Doug's uh, area of expertise. It, when you're up to that level, I think it's, it's a valuable tool. Um, when you're at a point where you're getting that uh, random hit of, uh, from a pathogen and it's, it's you know, you're looking at your five year spread and it's popped up every now and then or in different spots within the facility, uh, it is a good way, to, it's a good question to put out of the way, is this, you know, is it something that's coming in, in from different areas that we're seeing variety of or is it uh, resident? I think that's, yeah, very useful. Doug, I think this is probably an area for you to chime in on. Yeah, I, I agree with John is if you have an unlimited testing budget, then doing strain typing is um, a really nice way to get additional information that helps you answer that question, is it resonant or is it transient? Um, however, don't forget that because you're finding it in the environment, it may not matter where it's, um, whether it lives in that environment, you, you'll obviously have, if it's transient, a way in which it's being introduced into the environment. So you really need to look at the total picture in terms of how is it getting in, and then if it's in, how long does it reside in that facility? And obviously using strain typing is uh, the, the classical way in which to resolve those questions. All right, thank you. Um, and we've gotten a lot of questions before we proceed about whether or not the slides and recording will be sent out. Yes, the slides and a recording of this presentation will be emailed out to everyone who had registered for the webinar. They'll also be available to the public on our website. So we'll send more information about that tomorrow in a follow-up email. Next up, we have a question from Cindy. What is your opinion on zone one testing for pathogens if you are already testing finished products for pathogens? Um, again, I think, I think it's valuable. I think it's very valuable. You want to hit I think zone one, again, very targeted sampling. You don't want to just randomly pick the easiest to clean zone one uh, spots. You want to pick the hardest to clean, the, the damaged, the, the questionable, the, the really hard to reach zone ones where water pools. Um, uh, so I think, I think zone one is probably a better indicator. I think there are some certain concerns and risks depending on the nature of your product and, and your shipping procedures regarding uh, over-testing of finished product, but uh, Doug? Your opinion on this one? Yeah, John, I think the industry um, has, in, in my humble opinion, I'm going to insult everybody on the call, so just so you're aware, everybody's taking stupid pills when it comes to zone one testing. So again, this is highest risk surface where product actually touches food and being unwilling to test for a pathogen on those surface. So if your control plans are working, then the risk of you finding a pathogen on a direct product contact surface should be quite low. So if you only rely on an end product test, what you're really uh, gambling with is dilution is the solution to pollution. So if you have small environmental contaminant uh, potential on zone one surfaces, then as product is going across the surface, you're gonna be continually to dilute that out. So the odds of you finding a contamination doing an end product test are, are going to be really remote, even though you could have lot contamination. Uh, another way to also consider this is, um, again, e e end product testing is a data point, but it's telling you all the other things that might have gone into the process. So if you do environmental monitoring of a zone one surface, that's a data point that's very specific to that surface. Back to you, Sarah. Actually, I got a, the other point, Doug, on that one, I guess, is um, we, we both talked about uh, results and trending of results, um, part of the maturation of the process that I would think someone who, you know, when you first start, you probably may want to do a little bit of in pro uh, finished product testing. Um, but I would say within six months to a year of, of zero results on 
finished product, we have to start hunting a little further. And then you're going to go to zone one. You know, if you go for so long with no no fines whatsoever, no risks within the uh, controlled environment or, the, or that production environment, you know, that's when you start to look on the floor of the change room. Because if it's on the floor in the change room, it's not a direct product risk, but what you want to do is continually push that risk out further and further, expand your barriers to where you allow that pathogen, where you're hunting the pathogen. I'd much rather be hunting it, you know, in the change room in the cafeteria, figuring out how to get rid of it from there, knowing that if I get rid of it there, it's never going to make it into production than worrying about Gee, my, my finished product has pathogens in it. What do I need to react to right now? So it's it's that maturation of your process. You want to continually push out the barriers. All right, thank you guys. So our next question coming in is, is there a target uh, percentage for positive findings in an environmental program? You guys mentioned that zero probably means your program isn't set up correctly. Presumably 20% isn't good. What's world class? That's a good question. Um, I would think I would think world class is probably um, th that that maturation process that you can you can you know it's not about an environmental program. It's what you do with results. So you run your program for a certain length of time. You identify as as Doug mentioned hot spots. You have reactionary and and uh, and improvement areas within those hot spots, they're going to disappear and you're continually pushing it out. So I, I, I in my mind, good world class is a uh, significant period of time with, with very, very low results, potentially zero. And then you challenge your system and you up it, you up it a step uh, so that now you're finding, gosh, I would say less than 1% of your samples, but they're popping up every, every couple of series of, of examinations. You're finding something that's saying, hey, you, you need to make, do something a little differently. Doug? Yeah, this is a great question. I get all the time as an expert. I don't have an answer. And I'll tell you why I don't have an answer. And no experts really have a good answer. And that is every product and process is going to determine what's going to be in your environment. So if I were to tell the 500 attendees on this webinar that you should have an aerobic plate count of less than 100 on all your direct contact surfaces, that may not work for someone who is a manufacturer of fresh cut produce where there's no kelsip in the process and it's coming in with high microbial load. That might be a count that's too high for someone that there's a kill step in the process. The incoming materials have all had kill step supplied, so the bio burden coming into the process is very low. And so that might be an action level for someone in that kind of processing environment. So, you know, a world. You know, the, the world-class environmental monitoring program data set is really in the eyes of the beholder. And that, but that data set's going to tell a story about what you're doing in your facility. And what the auditors want to see, they want to see the story. They want to see how you're reacting out of specifications. And they want to see, you know, do you ignore trends that say there's an issue or do you take care of those when they occur? So again, a world-class environmental monitoring program tells your story that says your food safety plan is working. Great. We have time for probably just a couple more questions. So any questions that we don't have time to answer on this live broadcast, we will follow up um, with you individually via email after the presentation. So just know that if we run out of time, we'll make sure everyone gets a response. So this next question comes from Tyler. In regards to an effective environmental monitoring program, is there a standard to use for the number of swabs taken in relation to square feet of operational space in a facility? No, as you know, as we keep in, in to Doug's answer to the last one, there's no standard. Um, it depends on your product, your risk tolerance, the nature of your production. An older, you know, if you have two identical facilities with the only difference is one's 20 years older, you're probably going to do a little bit more on that 20 year old plant. Um, you need to do enough so that you're satisfied you're gaining a good picture through your sampling program. Uh, and that's why, you know, you're going to do best advice in the, in, in the beginning. But, you know, I think, I think when you first design your environmental monitoring program, if you design it with the mindset that everything will probably change because this is just the starting point and I'm going to continually adjust, um, no, there's no, there's no right answer. I mean, if, as you get better, you're going to shift from your high risk zones to your lower risk zones, you know, you're going to push it out. So you're going to do fewer 
you know, you're, you're going to drop your product testing to zero. You're going to drop your zone one down a fair bit. You're going to be looking at zone two, zone three, or however you want to design your or define your program. Uh, so no, it's, I like I like Doug's answer. You got to build it to make it work for you. Yeah, I agree completely, John. Um, we recommend front loading your testing budget to get as many data points as you can first off, because that's going to help you define your risk. It'll also help you find hot spots. Once you define your risk, once you find your hotspots, you get those hotspots under control, you, you know the rest of the environment also is under control, then you could reduce the number of samples that you might want to take in that facility based on, on risk. Uh, on the other hand, if you find uh, you've got an environment completely out of control, then uh, you need to be focusing your efforts on your control plans, not on your environmental monitoring, because your environmental monitoring already says you've got uh, a process environment that's out of control. So once you get those controls back into place, then again, you could go back to more uh, routine uh, monitoring rather than doing a bunch of investigational monitoring. Good. All right, one last one. What types of vector monitoring would you suggest would be most effective to evaluate where problem areas exist? Uh, I know from a BRC perspective, the, the, you know, one of the vectors that we worry about the most is footwear. It's hard to clean. It tends to be, uh, you know, it wears, so you have varying, you have varying opportunities. Each each pair of footwear is somewhat unique. Uh, and the, the risk of them going, you know, of, of truly captive to zone footwear, uh, it's, it's just not possible in the majority of plants. So that is an absolute number one vector for us um, that, we, that we really focus a lot of time and attention on, that you're going to have those barrier programs for footwear. Are they validated? Are they working? Are they monitoring? Uh, are being monitored appropriately? Uh, beyond that, I would think, um, Again, comes back to a certain degree. Doug, what have you seen in the way of unique vectors or, or most common vectors where there's uh, movement of pathogens into into high risk zones? Yeah, we. Uh, I'm going to make a pitch that attendees on this webinar take a a, a much broader environmental monitoring workshop or a class because yeah. in those classes the instructors will give you you know two or three hours worth of uh, information on where to look for hot spots in the facility. So they can be all over the place. We certainly are running out of time in the webinar. But um, another thing to consider too when you're doing your vector monitoring is what tools do you have in your toolbox? Are you only relying on ATP and visual inspection? And if that's the case, what do those two observational tools tell you about the presence or absence of pathogens? And they may be poorly correlated with pathogens. So if pathogens are a concern, make sure you're using the right analytical tools to be able to get you the, uh, the data to answer the question you're asking. All right, thank you guys both. Um, so just to get us wrapped up here, we'd like to thank everyone for attending in what is our largest webinar we've ever hosted. So thank you everyone who registered and everyone who tuned in for being a part of this. Um, thank you and congratulations. Uh, if you're ready to make the next steps like Doug suggested, you can contact Eurofins uh, at Euro, info at eurofinsus.com. Like I said, everyone will be getting a recording and a copy of these slides. We'll also be following up on individual questions um, throughout today and tomorrow. And with that, I will say thank you one final time to both John and Doug. Everyone have a wonderful day, and hopefully we'll see you back here for another webinar soon. Thanks.